Well, good. Again, good afternoon, everyone. Really great to be here with you on this wonderful Sabbath day. And of course, we are now a little less than two months away from observing the Passover, from commemorating the death of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You know, during his ministry, as you know, Christ performed many, many miracles, even raising Lazarus from the dead. When you look at that, raising someone from the dead, would you consider that to be Christ's greatest miracle of all the miracles he performed? Did Christ perform another miracle that was far greater than even raising Lazarus from the dead? What in the world could that be? Far greater in the sense that that particular miracle I'm thinking of here still impacts all of us today. There was one miracle Christ performed that still impacts each and every one of us today, even 2,000 years after his raising of Lazarus from the dead. It was Christ's final miracle before he died. It was the last miracle that he performed during his earthly ministry. What miracle was that? As we pick up the story, and I'm just in an introduction here, but as we pick up the story, Christ is just, I want to pick up the story in Luke 23 if you want to be turning there. But as we pick up the story here in Luke 23 to start with an in introduction, Christ has just been condemned to be crucified. He's now on his way to Calvary after having been severely beaten. Let's go to Luke chapter 23. As we pick up the story here, a man by the name of Simon, a Cyrenian, is carrying his cross. Luke 23, beginning in verse 26. Now as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Now, as he started out going, being led to Calvary after he was severely beaten on that Passover day long ago, Jesus began by carrying his own cross, as we're told in John 19, verse 17. But he was so weakened physically that his strength just gave out, and he couldn't carry it any further. A multitude of people here were following him when this happened. The very next verse here, verse 27, tells us that, which we'll read in a moment. But a Roman soldier then, can probably, the way this probably came about, a Roman soldier probably tapped this man on his shoulder with a flat blade of the, of the sword, which is how anyone would be pressed into immediate service by the Roman government at that time. A Roman soldier pat, tapped you on the shoulder with his sword, and that meant they were pressing you into service for the Roman government. And they did this when Christ dropped his, couldn't carry his cross anymore. One of the Roman soldiers there would have tapped this man on his shoulder, this Simon, to come in and help carry the cross for Jesus. The man, again, who was tapped here, is given his name as Simon, a Cyrenian. Why does it give, tell where he came from? Why is that important? It's interesting because he was from the far off city of Cyrene, which is modern day Tripoli, if you want to look it up. Today it's Tripoli. So you can figure out how far this was away from Jerusalem. Tripoli or Cyrene is 188 miles west of Jerusalem. 188 miles. Extremely long distance back at that time. They didn't have any modern ways to get from one area to another fast, mainly by walking or by a donkey or horseback. It's a long ways, 188 miles. And you just have to stop and think. This is Passover time in Jerusalem. Simon is probably a Jew. And you have to just kind of think about maybe what the circumstance might have been for him to be in Jerusalem at this particular time, this Simon. Undoubtedly, Simon had saved up maybe to make a special, possibly once-in-a-lifetime trip to Jerusalem to be there at the Passover, special time. He couldn't obviously get there very often, being 180 miles away. And you have to assume that maybe he had probably heard of Christ's many miracles and that he was going to be in Passover at that time. Maybe he would, maybe he could see him and meet this man who we'd heard about him performing all these miracles. Maybe he wanted to see him in person, so he made a special trek to Jerusalem, 180 miles to be there. So you might think that maybe this man, Simon, had come to Jerusalem to realize a dream of a lifetime, to be, at the be there at the time of the Passover, and to hopefully see this individual 
who he'd heard of who performed all these many, many fantastic miracles. Was he really who he claimed to be? Now, if that was the case, and that could have well been the case, what would be going through Simon's mind now as he's walking beside him with all these many multitudes as Christ is now condemned criminal, condemned to death, beaten right to within an inch of his life, and he's carrying his cross to Calvary where he's going to be crucified? What's going through Simon's mind? This man that he'd heard of performed all these miracles, did all these wonderful things. Now he finds himself walking beside Jesus on the way to Calvary. Then he's tapped on the shoulder by a Roman soldier to be pressed into service to carry his cross. How would Simon have felt at that point, do you think? Well, his heart was probably filled with bitter disappointment towards the Romans and towards this now condemned criminal who had now gotten him involved in what was happening. All of a sudden, he gets pulled into this. Simon does. He made the point of having to bear his cross. Continue here in Luke 23, verse 27. A great multitude of people followed him, and a woman who also mourned and lamented him, or women, I should say, and women who also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, blessed are the wombs that never bore, and breasts which never nursed. Now to think of that, you have to think of that in the context 2,000 years ago. Not today, not so much. Because at that time, there's almost nothing worse than for a woman to be barren and not be able to bear any children. And here Christ is telling these women that the time will come when women will be, feel blessed to be barren and have no children. That's how bad the times are going to be, he said. That would quite, be quite an impact at that time to make that statement. Verse 30, then they begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the greenwood, what's going to be done in the dry? If they do these things in what appears to be relatively good times, what will be done, we could say maybe today in times of terror, when all natural love will have dried up and be be gone, with only hatred remaining. You get a time like that, what, what's going to be done? What's going to happen? And we're kind of heading in that direction even here today. What then is Christ's greatest miracle that he ever performed? Going on, Luke 23, verse 32, there were also two others, criminals, who were led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the criminals, one on the right, hand and the other on the left. Then at this precise moment, as Christ had been nailed to the cross, he performed his greatest miracle in my view. A miracle that still has profound impact on all of us today. Verse 34, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Very interesting, Mr. Japheth gave a sermonette on forgiveness because that's what this sermon is also going to be on, forgiveness. Because Christ's greatest miracle was a miracle of forgiveness, and it is a miracle. So as we begin to examine ourselves before the Passover, how well do we understand, how well do we understand Christ's miracle of forgiveness? How well do we really understand it? Why would forgiveness be a miracle? What is forgiveness? What does it entail? What happened when Christ forgave you and me? What actually took place at the moment when Christ forgave us and, or when God the Father through Christ forgave us, maybe a better way of saying it. And he's just like Mr. Japheth, he already went through there and got into it. Of course, he didn't spend too much time in it, but he touched on it and gave a very good explanation of it. But I'm going to cover that again, too, not today, but next time. What about Colossians 2.14? <laughs> What did Christ really nail to the cross? And does what Christ nailed to the cross involve the miracle of forgiveness? And what happens if we don't forgive others? In that case, if we don't forgive someone, in that case, who is the big loser 
and why. See, forgiveness is a huge subject, extremely important one to understand, especially as we prepare now for the Passover once again. Again, I'm going to go into it very in depth, depth here, and I want to cover this, this miracle of forgiveness actually in two sermons. So this will be part one, and then I'll cover in more depth next time in part two. But today here, I want to give part one on the subject of forgiveness. Today I want to look at the big picture. I want to over, get an overview of the big picture on this subject. And when I look at the big picture, I want to a- ask and answer these questions. What does God really want? What is God's des- desire above all things? What prevents God from having his do- desire, his greatest desire, realized? And what provision did God initially make so his desire could eventually be realized? And what role does forgiveness play in all of that? So my title for this sermon here this afternoon is The Miracle of Forgiveness, Part 1, The Big Picture. The Miracle of Forgiveness, Part 1, The Big Picture. Now right after Christ was nailed to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And those who nail Christ to the cross and those who condemn Christ, they did not deserve to be forgiven, did they? They didn't deserve to be forgiven. But Christ had a forgiving spirit. So looking at the big picture, as we, will, as we will here now, we will see that this has been the case from the very beginning, that Christ had a forgiving spirit from the very beginning. From the very moment Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. So what is the big picture then? Where do we begin to look at the big picture? To see what God desires more than anything else. Let's go back to the very beginning. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. To get the big picture, we want to go back to, very, go back to the very beginning. Genesis chapter 1, and one of my favorite scriptures, Genesis 126, because Genesis 126 really gives us the specific purpose statement for the entire Bible. Right here, one verse. Genesis 126, then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and so on. Let let us make man in our image according to our likeness. That then is a specific purpose statement for the entire Bible, for the entire word of God. It is the purpose for which all of us were created and given the very precious gift of life. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. See, more than anything else, God desires for us to be created into his spiritual image and likeness. That is God's purpose for giving us life. That's the big picture. Why? Why does God want to make us into his image and likeness? Why why is that? Now, to answer that question, we have to actually go from the beginning of God's word to the very end of God's word. Let's go back to Revelation 21. It tells us why God wants to create us into his spiritual image and likeness. That's also part of the big picture. Revelation 21, verse 1, here's a vision of John into the future. which shows us why God wants to create us into his spiritual image and likeness. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. And then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, 
and God himself will be with them and be their God. Why does God want to make us into his image and likeness? Because he wants to live with us forever. Simple as that. He wants to live with us forever. And he wants us to share his domain and live with him forever. God wants to dwell with us as a husband dwells with his wife. He wants to have a deeply personal relationship with us forever as part of his family. Again, he wants to become permanent members of his divine family. And that is the big picture. Now, understanding that big picture then, what is the main obstacle in God's path that can prevent God from having his desire realized? What stands in the way? What separates us from God? Let's go to Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59, beginning in verse 1. First three verses here. Isaiah 59, beginning in verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to save all of mankind so they can be a part of his family forever. Nor is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But there's something that stands in the way of God realizing that. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perversity. But you all notice something striking in verse 2. Maybe you got to read it again. See, what does verse 2 say and what doesn't it say? I bet if I asked all of us to say, what does verse 2 say? I bet you'd say it just off the top of your head. You wouldn't get it right. See, it does not say your iniquities have separated you from God. That's not what it says. See, what does it say instead? It says your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your God, my God, our God. What does that tell us? It tells us that God wants a very personal relationship with us. It's personal. He wants us to be his bride. He wants to dwell with us and live with us forever. It's very, very personal. He is your God. He's not just God, he's your God, your personal God. He wants a personal relationship with you and me. See, my iniquities don't separate me from God. They separate me from my God. And your iniquities don't just separate you from God. They separate you from your God. Because God is very personal. He wants to be very personally involved in each of our lives. He wants a personal relationship with each and every one of us. See, God has a dream. And the one thing that stands in the way of God realizing his dream is our iniquities. Because our iniquities separate us from our God. So then what provision then did God initially make after man sinned? After man separated himself from his God? To look at that, let's go back again to where it all began. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. Let's go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. There's quite a bit right here. Genesis 2, verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, Adam, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, in the day, you shall surely die. What happened? Genesis 3, verse 6. When a woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then what did God say? 
Verse 11. He said, well, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I command you that you should not eat? How did Adam respond to that? Verse 12. Then the man, Adam, said, Why, the woman, the woman whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. She, she gave it to me. Blame her. Why did Adam blame his wife? And then why did God, Adam here, if you look at it closely, why did he blame, he blame God as well? Because when we mean how he blamed God, he says, the woman you gave to me, you gave her to me. She's at fault and you're at fault. That's kind of what Adam is insinuating here. See, human nature doesn't naturally want to admit responsibility. Likes to shift the blame somewhere else if it possibly can. Why is that? Well, primarily it's because we have all been influenced by Satan and by the ways of the world. And because we all have to learn to take personal responsibility. It's much easier to try to shift the blame to somebody else than take personal responsibility. That's hard. You have to swallow some things and eat some crow to do that sometimes. It's hard. But as God told Adam in Genesis 2.17, as we mentioned again, he said, in the day that you eat of it, in the day of you eat of the, tree, of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or in the day we could say that you allow Satan to influence your mind and your thoughts, in the day that you allow your iniquities to separate you from your God, you shall surely die. That's what it says. Now, what did Paul say in Romans 6, 23? He said, the wages of sin is death. If Adam and Eve sinned, and if the wages of sin is death, then why didn't God immediately take the lives of Adam and Eve? Because that's what he said he didn't do. Why didn't he? Didn't God just tell them, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die? Why then didn't God take their lives? Why did God delay judgment? Why didn't he do what he said? After all, that's what they deserved. See, we think of ourselves, why doesn't God punish us immediately after we sin? Why does God seemingly delay judgment sometimes when we fall short? See, the answer, when you think about it, is both, all, both simple and very profound at the same time. So profound, in fact, you think about it, that it can literally change lives. It can change our hearts if we let it. See, what does sin do? Sin creates a deficit. Now, what do I mean by that? Whenever there is sin... Something is taken away from the sinner, from the one committing the sin. Whenever there is sin, the one committing the sin loses something. Let's look at what happened right here in the Garden of Eden. We'll see that principle demonstrated. Genesis 3.14 The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. And on your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. The serpent lost his standing in the animal kingdom. In a very high standing, all of a sudden it's got the lowest standing. It lost its standing. Verse 16. And to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be to your husband, and he shall rule over you. Adam and Eve lost the harmony that they'd had in their relationship with each other. When you sin, you lose something. You create a deficit. And Adam and Eve also lost the relationship they had with God. Their sin separated them from their God, and they lost their home in the Garden of Eden. Verse 23, therefore, or verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 23, therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden. They lost their position. They couldn't be in the garden anymore. Therefore the Lord God sent 
him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. They lost access to the tree of life. When you sin, you create a deficit. You lose something. Their sin has separated them from their God, and they lost their home in the Garden of Eden. They lost access to the tree of life. I want to, I want, I've covered this with some of you maybe before, but I want to do it over it again. Why was this particular garden here, why was it called Eden? A lot of meaning there. The answer is actually even hinted at here in verse 24. But the ancient Hebrew word picture meaning of Eden is to see the door to life. In ancient Hebrew, Eden is written by Eden is written by three Hebrew letters, Ayan, Dalet, and Nun are the three letters in Hebrew. Ayan was drawn in ancient Hebrew to picture an eye, a human eye, and it was symbolic of seeing to see. Dela was pictured as a door or a doorway. And Nun was pictured like a fish darting, swimming through water and darting a pictured vibrant life. So the word picture meaning of Eden is to see the door to life. And they were right there. They were there having the door to eternal life if they wanted to follow God and obey God and go through it. And all they would have to be, they were human. Yeah, they would have died, but they had that opportunity. That was made available to them. Also, the last two letters in Eden, Dalet, Noon, picturing door to life, are also those two letters, Dalet, Noon, are also the Hebrew word for Dan, which means judge. So it also could mean to see the judge. Who's our ultimate judge who's also the only door to life? I'm just going to quote John 10, verses 7 and 9. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. What else did Christ say? He said, The Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. John 5, 22. So Christ is our ultimate judge, and Christ is the only door to life. And he was right there with Adam and Eve at that time trying to lead them to that door in the Garden of Eden. In Eden, where they could see the judge and see the door to life. But sin now caused them to lose out on that opportunity to walk through that door to life at that time. Again, then the, therefore the Lord, verse 23, sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword was turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life, to guard the door to life, which would now have to be opened through another venue. Now mankind was going to have to go through another door. They're going to have to go through the door of forgiveness. See, Adam and Eve here lost access to the tree of life. They lost access to Eden, to the door to life, to the door to eternal life. But whenever there is sin, the sinner loses something that is outside of the sinner's power to regain of and by himself. See, here's a profound point that can change our hearts. All sin is against God, as even as was pointed out there a little bit, Mr. Japheth in the sermonette. All says against God, even as David acknowledged in his prayer that was referred to in the sermonette in Psalm 51.4, after David said with Bathsheba, where David said, Psalm 51.4, against you and you only have I sinned and done evil in your sight. See, when every human being sin against God, thus cutting themselves off from God, God then provides a channel through which fellowship with God can be restored. Here's the thing that's amazing. It's very profound. God provides a channel through which that relationship can be restored. See, so instead of bringing immediate judgment, which we deserve, or as anyone would deserve who would separate himself from God through iniquities, instead of bringing immediate judgment, instead of retribution, 
God instead delays judgment and provides a means by which fellowship can then be restored so his relationship with mankind can be reestablished. See, it's very essential for us to understand that in relation to the pro concept of forgiveness because it all ties into the concept of forgiveness. Why? Because it demonstrates that God wants a relationship with us far more than he wants retribution. He doesn't want retribution. He wants a relationship with us. He wants a personal relationship with us. He wants to dwell with us forever. He wants to be in his family. See, God doesn't want retribution for our sins against him. He doesn't want us to have to pay him back by dying for our sin, even though that's what we deserve. Instead, God wants to provide a means by which our relationship with him can then be restored. And through the means God provides, we can see that God even desires to have fellowship with sinful men and women in order to give them the opportunity to repent and change. Thus, God delays judgment for sin. Example of the means God provides is given to us right here in Genesis in the case of Cain and Abel. Right here in Gen early chapters of Genesis. Let's look at that. Genesis chapter 4. Verse 3, it says, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Now the Hebrew words translated in the process of time literally mean at the end of days, as many margins will say, at the end of days, which is how this should be translated. And at the end of days it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. At the end of days. And that phrase, as it should be, the at the end of days, clearly indicates Cain and Abel knew in advance the day on which they were to bring this offering. They knew in advance what day it was. It was a specific day that God had let them know of in advance where they were to bring an offering. So this is the day which had been set by God in advance and on which they were to then bring an offering or offerings to God. Now notice verses 4 and 5. It says, Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel in his offering, but he did not respect Cain in his offering. And I'll stop there for a moment. He did not respect Cain in his offering. Now the Hebrew words also brought in verse 4 indicate that in addition to bringing an offering of the fruit of the ground in verse 3, that Abel then also brought of the firstborn of his flock in addition to that, in addition to his offering of the fruit of the ground. But the offering of the fruit of the ground would have been a grain offering as described in Leviticus chapter 2. Thus, these verses indicate that both Cain and Abel brought a grain offering at this appointed time. They both brought a grain offering. But then it tell, indicates here, if you read between the lines and look at it closely and analyze it, that in addition to that, in addition to the grain offering, Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock. Now, why is that really important to understand? Well, first of all, we can only speculate as to which set day or appointed day this, this was. It doesn't tell us. I mean, you might think it was a Passover, at which time a firstborn of the flock was to be offered, but there's nothing, nothing about a grain offering on Passover, firstborn of the flock. I'm not going to speculate what day it was. I, I'm going to speculate a little bit, but I mean, some may think well, maybe it was Pentecost, but I want to speculate on something else. Maybe was it during the days of unleavened bread on the day the wave sheaf was made, on which day a male lamb of the first year without blemish was also to be offered. If you look at Leviticus 23, verses 11 and 12, it says on that day, the day the wave sheaf was offered, there was to be a lamb was to be offered and also a grain offering was made on that day. On the day after the Sabbath, during the days of unleavened bread, which picture putting sin out of our lives, both a grain offering and a male lamb were to be offered. That began, of course, the countdown to Pentecost portraying the spiritual harvest of the first fruits, who must have their sins covered under the blood of Jesus Christ. At any rate, whatever it was, I'm not going to say what day it was, we don't know, but that's just speculation, but at any rate, Abel were bringing in addition to his offering of the fruit of the ground, an offering of the firstborn of his flock. What was Abel doing by doing that? 
Abel was acknowledging that he was a sinner, a sinner who needed forgiveness. Because there could be no forgiveness of sin without the spilling of blood. Which is why God respected Abel's offering and why God did not respect Cain's offering. It's also why in Hebrews 11.4 it says, By faith Abel was thus offered a greater or more excellent sacrifice than Cain did because he, ad- he gave additional offering that indicated, I'm a sinner, I need forgiveness. I need to be forgiven. Cain didn't give that offering. Which is why God did not respect Cain's offering because his offering was not complete. Cain's offering didn't acknowledge that he was a sinner who needed forgiveness. Of course, Cain's human nature then got the best of him. He became very angry, verse 5. Going on in verse 6. So the Lord said to Cain, well, why are you so angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And his desire is for you. His desire is to take you out and separate you from God. But you should rule over it. But as we realize our own human nature and being influenced by the world and everything around us and by Satan, none of us can perfectly rule over sin, which continually also lies at our door, just waiting to entrap us. Now, in this case here, Cain's anger led to murder. He killed his brother. And anger in our society leads to mur- many, many murders every day. You see it on the news. But even for the people of God, anger can lead to the murder or destruction of a relationship or to irreparable damage in a relationship if we let our anger get out of control. It can do permanent damage to a relationship that's hard to repair sometimes or difficult. But the main point in all this is that even here, in the case of Cain, God delayed judgment. Cain murdered his brother Abel, but God still delayed judgment, giving Cain a chance to repent. Now, Cain did have to suffer grave consequences, which actually felt was more than he could bear, as it says in Genesis 4.13. But God didn't take his life. He delayed ultimate judgment, giving Cain a chance to repent. So the main purpose then of this example is to demonstrate that immediately after sin entered the world, God instituted a way through which those who sinned could have an opportunity to restore their relationship with God. And this example then also illustrates the means that God provided so a sinner's relationship could then be restored to God. And in the Old Testament, it was by and through animal sacrifices, as we know. Because sin demands the death penalty. In the Old Testament, the life of an animal, the life of a lamb without blemish, was substituted for the life of the sinner. The sin of the individual was then transferred to that lamb so restitution could be made. Now, when the Old Testament animal offering was made, The one making the offering was to put his hand on the head of the burnt offering in order for that offering to be accepted on his behalf. It tells us that in Leviticus 1, verse 4. Why? Why was he to put his head on the animal that was to be offered? To signify that his sin was then being transferred to that sacrificial animal. He was transferring his sins onto that animal, symbolically. It was a reminder that the penalty of sin is death, and that the penalty must be paid, and that penalty must be paid to make up for the deficit sin brings. Only well, the New Testament under the Old Covenant, instead of a sinner being put to death, an animal is then put to death. His iniquity was transferred symbolically to that animal. And the life of the animal was substituted for the life of the one who had sinned before God. And the person offering a sacrifice was to acknowledge that by placing his hand on the head of the animal. Genesis 4, 7 indicates that if a person did that, they could then once again be accepted by God. 
Set the back into having fellowship with God by being forgiven by God. What did God do immediately after Adam and Eve sinned? Let's go back here just for a moment again. What did God do immediately after Adam and Eve sinned? Genesis 3, verse 21. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and he clothed them. Or as the old King James has it, he made coats of skin. Now think about what he did. He, he, he took skins from animals and he made clothes for them or coverings for them. Coats or coverings from the skins of an animal. Which would indicate what? It would indicate that God himself sacrificed an animal to give them a covering. Implying spiritually that God covered their sin through a sacrificial system. Thus providing a means by which the relationship with God could be restored. See, God's love and desire for us is so great that he'll set aside judgment and instead provide us a means through which we can then be forgiven and through which our sins can be covered. But in the case of the old covenant system, sin was only temporarily covered. Let's go to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices was the offer continually year after year make those who approach who approach God and God's throne perfect. The law here being the law pertaining to animal sacrifices which foreshadowed the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. See, sacrificing an animal cannot take away the penalty for sin. It cannot bring forgiveness or change a human heart. Ultimately, in the ultimate sense. Why? Verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice an offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. You created me and my body a means by which I can do, follow through, and do your will. And be forgiven. And repent. See, animal sacrifices only temporarily covered sin, so a person's relationship could then be restored until full restitution could then be made by the sacrifice of a perfect, sinless victim. Until full forgiveness could be made by means of a perfect human sacrifice. Until full, absolute forgiveness then could be rendered. Until the debt of sin could then be paid in full and removed so there was no more indebtedness whatsoever. One, I'll conclude there for now. But the big picture of forgiveness is that God loves us so much that he willingly covered and set aside mankind's sins until a perfect sacrificial victim could be made. And of course, that was going to be himself. Christ is going to be that victim. Showed the love he had for mankind. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll be that perfect victim. I'll take all the sins of the world upon myself. So you can be, have the debt cleared. But that's the big picture. He set aside mankind's sin until a perfect sacrifice could be made. And he willingly set aside his wrath. And he willingly delayed judgment. So the big picture is that God wants to dwell with us. He wants to be our God. He doesn't want payment, or restitution, or immediate judgment. He wants to have a relationship with us. And he wants to, us to have a relationship with him. That's what he wants. He wants to be our God. And he wants us to be his people. He wants us to become permanent members of his divine family. So that then is the big picture when it comes to forgiveness. Part two, we will get more into the New Testament. And into what forgiveness really means and entails. And again, it was covered here in the sermonette and very, very well, well, as well. but I want to go into even deep more depth, uh, even a closer look at Colossians 2.14, and to go in a little bit deeper as to what the handwriting of requirements that was against us really was, and what it was that was really nailed to the cross, and what 
Colossians 2.14 has to do with forgiveness. We'll discover all that next time in more depth as well. And also, why must all of us become like God in developing a spirit and attitude of forgiveness? That's so essential for every human being to have that mentality that God had, to have that spirit in us, to be wanting to forgive no matter what. Why is that so important for us to have a forgiving spirit? And my, why, why must we forgive others as God has forgiven us? We'll cover all that next time in part two on forgiveness.